evening. Am I audible? Good evening. Hi, um, Mahak. Yeah, good evening, Mahak. Uh, paracetamol, we are just starting because there is a technical glitch. Yes. Um, so, good evening, all of you. If you are joining my session for the first time, this is Dr. Shangopriya. I am your An Academy educator for biochemistry. And uh, uh, I am working as professor and head of the department of biochemistry at Government Tutukudi Medical College. And uh, this session is on uh, sh shortcuts. I am good. Uh, no. Your voice comes very low. Is my voice very low, all of you? Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Good evening, Nisha. Good evening, Kuldeep. Uh, good evening, Dilip Kumar. Uh, am I uh, audible, all of you? Okay. So, this session is on. Uh, it's basically about uh, shortcuts to memorize vitamin deficiency diagnosis because I know you must have all learned about many deficiency manifestations, right? Audible but slightly low. Okay. I am good, Anirudhas, and meeting you after a long time. Yes. So let's start this. So this is about memorizing vitamin deficiency diagnosis because we always learn about uh, various um, uh, his load tests, right? Histidine load test, tryptophan load test, methyl malonic acid needs to be elevated. And even the latest NEET PG, there was a question which asked you what will be the diagnosis that you will do to detect a riboflavin deficiency, B2 or riboflavin deficiency, right? So to be able to answer such questions, I thought you should have few shortcuts. So basically this session is about that. But what I want to tell you all is it's not just about shortcuts. I will also give you conceptually the reason behind why such low tests are done to detect those vitamin deficiencies. Okay. So simultaneously we will be having a conceptual discussion as well as I'll also give you shortcuts to remember. Okay. So that's an introduction to this session. And before we start the session, let me tell you a few facts about an academy's plans. So currently there is a, an Unacademy Unlock 20 plan that is going on which is uh, for a short period till today. So till today if you apply for any of the subscription plans you get 20% off for iconic subscription and for plus subscription there is 20% plus 15% off. Okay. So should I be more loud? Um, one second. I think this should help you. Am I audible now? It should be audible now, right? Maybe the next time I'll use some mic. Uh, is it is it audible now? MBBS first year biochemistry. How should I? Uh, Mahak, I'm starting a, a course. Uh, it is basically a foundation course for first MBBS which you can join. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thanks a lot. So uh, to get this uh, subscription plan, you can use any educator's code. My code is Shanmugapriya. Okay, and then currently we have a new batch which is NEET PG 2023 Integrated and System Wise batch which started just yesterday. In this batch, uh, preclinical and paraclinical subjects will be integrated with clinical subjects. So it will be completely clinically integrated course. And this course will happen in three modules. In the first module, it will be, as I told you, uh, dual educator sessions will be conducted, where in preclinical uh, educators will integrate with the, uh, those subjects will be integrated with clinical subjects and the duration of this course would be from August till October. And then the second module is a previous year question discussion batch which starts in the month of October ends in November. And finally we have an image based question discussion. So if you attend this you will have an edge over others as far as NEET PG 2023 is concerned. Okay. Foundation batch is starting on September 2nd Mahak. I'm starting it on September 2nd. I will be posting the link tonight. You can join that. Okay. And then we also have a question bank 2.0. And this will help you in excelling in NEET PG exam. Yes. NEET PG exam. Highlight of this question bank is that there are around 18,000 18, plus brand new question. Most of those are clinical case based. They are all integrated MCQs. So utilize that question back and this is available for plus subscribers, iconic subscribers. Now let's start discussing these MCQs. This is the first question for today evening. The question is a chronic alcoholic presence with an episode of hypoglycemia 
he is treated with dextrose infusion and thiamine injection so at this point i would like to tell you one fact yeah it is a chronic alcoholic is susceptible to develop repeated episodes of hypoglycemia i will tell you why when we discuss alcohol metabolism i have scheduled a youtube session even for chronic alcoholism when we discuss that i would i would explain why but for now a chronic alcoholic is susceptible to develop repeated episodes of hypoglycemia and a chronic alcoholic is also susceptible to develop thiamine deficiency okay so both these facts are provided to you they have not asked you those two facts they have given you a chronic alcoholic presence with an episode of hypoglycemia he is treated with dextrose infusion with thiamine injection before discharge he is advised about effects of chronic alcoholism and so he wants to check his thiamine availability status so everything is provided the question is very simple what is the investigation you would prescribe to check the thiamine availability status what would be your answer very good richa very good uh, ruhi harshit all of you aniruddha sen excellent so what is answer it is rbc transketolase activity whenever you suspect thiamine deficiency what are you going to ask for you should ask for rbc transketolase activity because one of the thiamine dependent enzymes is transketolase now how do we remember this how do we remember the thiamine deficiency can be detected by estimating rbc transketolase activity for this i want you to pick up two words yeah one is keto yeah one is keto the other one is thiamine what is thiamine thiamine is b1 so keto and one what is the common link between keto and one how many of you have heard of keto diet all of you have you all heard of i'm not saying i'm not asking you what is the principle behind keto diet i'm asking you have you heard of keto diet right so you must have all heard of this keto diet in keto diet there is something called as one meal a day have you heard of it yeah keto diet there is something called as one meal a day so have this as a clue if you suspect one b1 deficiency yeah if you suspect b1 deficiency what will you ask for you will ask for keto transketolase activity erythrocyte transketolase activity because one of the thiamine dependent enzymes is transketolase okay now if it is thiamine deficiency that is detected by transketolase activity what will you do to detect riboflavin deficiency or b2 deficiency that can be diagnosed by estimating what it is glutathione reductase enzyme activity so if you suspect riboflavin deficiency what are you going to ask for you are going to ask for rbc's glutathione reductase activity now how do we remember this will you all agree with me if i say that ribbon and glue go hand in hand as far as craft work is concerned yeah ribbon and glue go hand in hand as far as craft work is concerned so have this image in mind so if you suspect riboflavin deficiency ribbon and glue what will you use is glue to remember it is glutathione reductase enzyme activity yes it was an ini cet question okay so that's about b2 deficiency and then if you suspect niacin deficiency b3 or niacin deficiency it is very simple all that you will have to do is estimate niacinamide levels in rbcs what are you going to do you are going to estimate niacinamide levels in rbcs or you can estimate metabolite of niacin what is a metabolite of niacin it is methyl niacinamide so urinary methyl niacinamide can also be estimated isn't that very simple yeah if you suspect niacin deficiency what will you estimate you estimate erythrocyte nad concentration or in urine you estimate a metabolite of niacin which is methyl niacinamide concentration so let me help you recall all the facts that i told you so far starting with b1 deficiency please repeat it along with me one meal a day keto diet so one keto so it is rbc transketolase activity do you understand this and then if you suspect b2 deficiency what is the other name for b2 it is riboflavin and what did i tell you about riboflavin ribbon and glue so what will you estimate rbc glutathione reductase activity 
yeah it is rbc glutathione don't say glutathione peroxidase many a time students make a confusion here so if it is riboflavin deficiency ribbon and glue it is glutathione reductase activity if you suspect b3 deficiency what will you estimate you will estimate rbc nad concentration or in urine you estimate metabolite of niacin which is methyl niacinamide concentration okay so that's about basic facts related to vitamin deficiency so can you answer this question now thiamine deficiency or thiamine availability status can be diagnosed by estimating what it is rbc transketolase activity okay so this is the right answer and don't we know already about rbc glutathione reductase activity when will you estimate glutathione reductase activity when you suspect b2 or riboflavin deficiency okay so next question is this a known patient of tuberculosis is on inh uh, and he presents with microcytic hypochromic anemia his serum ferritin and transferrin saturation are normal so can you all tell me what is the most common cause of microcytic hypochromic anemia it is iron deficiency so the clinician here has suspected iron deficiency that is why the clinician has estimated ferritin and transferrin levels but what is what has happened to ferritin and transferrin saturation levels they are normal which means what have you excluded you have excluded very good paracetamol very good ruhi excellent yes so what have you excluded if excluded iron deficiency so if it is not mineral deficiency what will you suspect you can suspect vitamin deficiency so vitamin deficiency is suspected as a cause of microcytic hypochromic anemia which vitamin deficiency can cause microcytic hypochromic anemia is the first part of the question the second part of the question is what is the investigation of choice for diagnosing this condition okay so what do you think can be the cause of microcytic hypochromic anemia as far as vitamin deficiency is concerned very good uh, sanu yes it is b6 deficiency b6 or pyridoxal phosphate deficiency so why should b6 or pyridoxal phosphate deficiency cause microcytic hypochromic anemia it is because the coenzyme role of pyridoxal phosphate should be memorized there are two coenzyme roles of pyridoxal phosphate which i want every one of you to remember one is pyridoxal phosphate acts as a coenzyme for transaminases please memorize it it's necessary for transaminases it is also necessary for decarboxylases have you memorized this yeah b6 or pyridoxal phosphate is necessary for transaminases and decarboxylases and one of the example for decarboxylase very good shanmug shanmugapriyan so we share the same name so one example for decarboxylation reaction is ala synthase where have you come across ala synthase ala synthase is the rate limiting enzyme of heme synthesis so tell me what will happen when there is b6 deficiency when there is b6 deficiency ala synthase will be inactive so heme synthesis gets affected so that causes microcytic hypochromic anemia so vitamin deficiency causing microcytic hypochromic anemia what will be your suspicion your suspicion should be b6 deficiency or pyridoxal phosphate deficiency okay now what is the relevance between what is the relationship between inh intake and b6 deficiency can anybody try to tell me why should inh intake cause b6 deficiency it is based on the fact that pyridoxal phosphate is the coenzyme form of b6 but for you to form pyridoxal phosphate pyridoxal the aldehyde form of b6 should be converted to pyridoxal phosphate in the presence of pyridoxal kinase and your inh isoniazide is also an aldehyde so it's a structural analog of pyridoxal so it competitively inhibits pyridoxal kinase so what will not be synthesized 
pyridoxal phosphate cannot be synthesized and that is why inh intake will cause b6 deficiency and that is why inh intake can cause peripheral neuropathy and can cause microcytic hypochromic anemia exactly shanmuga priya you are right it's a competitive inhibitor of pyridoxal kinase okay now apart from this what are the other clinical conditions that you can observe in vitamin b6 deficiency based on which you will be able to make a test yeah if you suspect b6 deficiency what is the test that you are going to ask for that is based on the fact that vitamin b6 is necessary as a coenzyme for kininurinase have you all heard of it it is necessary as a coenzyme for which enzyme kininurinase which is involved in the conversion of tryptophan to niacin so do you all know that though niacin is a vitamin when i say it's a vitamin it's a it's an essential micronutrient and you know all essential micronutrients should be supplied in the diet which means they cannot be synthesized in the body but there is an exception niacin can be synthesized by your body from tryptophan you must have all learnt that 60 mg of tryptophan is equivalent to 1 mg of niacin yes or no yeah 60 mg of tryptophan is equivalent to 1 mg of niacin so during the conversion of tryptophan to niacin what is the enzyme that is involved it is kininurinase okay so have a look at this tabular column or this flow chart i know this flow chart looks very confusing it looks complex but all that i want you to remember is in the conversion of tryptophan to niacin there is an enzyme what is the enzyme's name i told you the enzyme's name is kininurinase and what is the speciality of kininurinase it is dependent on b6 or pyridoxal phosphate so now tell me what do you expect in pyridoxal phosphate deficiency whenever there is b6 deficiency the precursor kininurin gets converted to xanthurinic acid very good praveen i am very happy that you have answered this correctly yes xanthurinic acid has to be estimated so whenever there is b6 deficiency the precursor kininurin gets converted to xanthurinic acid so have a look at this if you suspect b6 deficiency please look at what i'm projecting here if you suspect b6 deficiency in b6 do you see an x all of you tell me a yes sono in b6 do you see an x yeah so x stands for xanthurinic acid levels so if you suspect b6 deficiency what will you estimate in urine you have to estimate xanthurinic acid levels in urine after what load what should you give you should give a tryptophan load how are you going to remember that it's tryptophan load for xanthurinic acid estimation after x what is the alphabet that you see after x it is y so use that y to remember that it is tryptophan yeah use that y to remember that it is tryptophan so how will you remember this if you suspect b6 deficiency 6 ends with an x so what will you estimate you will estimate xanthurinic acid levels after what load after tryptophan load why do we do this because the enzyme kininurinase yeah because the enzyme kininurinase is dependent on b6 is that clear okay and the other load test so this is about tryptophan load test what is the other load test that you can think of it is histidin load test and what is the basis of histidin load test it is figlu test have you all heard of figlu test yeah figlu test is done to detect folate deficiency so why do we do that it is because during histidin's metabolism so before that let's try to answer this question which vitamin deficiency please answer this question which vitamin deficiency can cause microcytic hypochromic anemia what should be your answer it is b6 deficiency and if you suspect b6 deficiency what will you estimate in urine you will estimate xanthurinic acid levels in urine after what load yes after what load after y tryptophan load test okay so now you know about choice d you also know already about choice c what did i tell you about choice c b2 or riboflavin deficiency ribbon and glue so what will you estimate glutathione reductase activity in rbcs 
So we know about choice D and about choice C. Let's try to understand about folate and B12. Okay. So whenever you suspect folate deficiency, F for F, what is the test that you're going to do? You're going to estimate FIGLU levels in urine after histidine load. After what load? It is histidine load. How do we remember it? F stands for F. If you suspect folate deficiency, it is FIGLU levels. FIGLU has got F and G. What is the next alphabet after F and G? It is H. So after what load? It is histidine load. I will tell you why do we do this. It is because whenever histidine gets metabolized, yeah, whenever histidine gets metabolized, it gives rise to FIGLU. Now what after you form FIGLU? If there is tetrahydrofolate, listen to this, if there is tetrahydrofolate, FIGLU will transfer its form amino group to tetrahydrofolate, converting tetrahydrofolate to form amino tetrahydrofolate. Do you understand this? After you form FIGLU, if there is tetrahydrofolate, FIGLU will donate its form amino group to tetrahydrofolate, converting it into form amino tetrahydrofolate. Thereby FIGLU becomes glutamate. What if FIGLU becomes glutamate? Glutamate can become alpha ketoglutarate and it can get into citric acid cycle. It can come out as carbon dioxide. So listen to this carefully. Whenever you metabolize anything in your body, it can be a carbohydrate, it can be an amino acid, it can be a lipid, irrespective of whatever it is. Whenever you metabolize any fuel in your body, your aim is to convert all these fuels into a citric acid cycle intermediate. Why do we want them to get converted to a citric acid cycle intermediate? Because citric acid cycle will convert all those intermediates into carbon dioxide after which you can relax because carbon dioxide can be exhaled out and that is what is done in histidine's metabolism also. But for this metabolism to happen, you want tetrahydrofolate. So tell me what will happen when there is folate deficiency. Tell me what do you expect when there is folate deficiency? FIGLU cannot donate its form amino group. So FIGLU levels will be elevated. So whenever there is folate deficiency, which level gets elevated? FIGLU level gets elevated, which you will identify after giving what load? After giving histidine load. Do you all understand this? After giving histidine load. So what do you mean by FIGLU test? Whenever you suspect folate deficiency, good, very good, uh, Kwame, yeah, Bempong, good. So whenever you suspect folate deficiency, it starts with the letter F. So what will you estimate? You will estimate FIGLU levels in urine. After giving what load? After giving histidine load. Yeah. So now if you fill up this tabular column, okay. So now you know folate deficiency can be detected by what? FIGLU levels in urine. So we know about choice B also. So which choice are you yet to learn about? We have to now learn about B12 deficiency. Why do you estimate methyl malonic acid levels in urine whenever you suspect B12 deficiency? Can you or can any one of you here tell me in the live chat what are the two coenzyme forms of B12? Yeah, what are the two coenzyme forms of B12? One is methyl B12, the other one is adenosyl B12. So please memorize it. The two coenzyme roles of B12 are methyl B12 and adenosyl B12. Okay. And what is the role of adenosyl B12? I'm not going to get into the details of methyl B12, which I will tell you later on when we discuss about one carbon pool. But for now about adenosyl B12, the coenzyme role of adenosyl B12 is that it acts as a coenzyme for methyl malonyl CoA mutase. Please memorize it. What is the coenzyme role of adenosyl B12? It acts as a coenzyme for methyl malonyl CoA mutase. And what is the function of methyl malonyl CoA mutase? It helps in the conversion of methyl malonyl CoA to succinyl CoA. It helps in the conversion of methyl malonyl CoA to succinyl CoA. From where do you get this methyl malonyl CoA? Can anybody answer that? From where do we get this methyl malonyl CoA? Odd chain fatty acids on oxidation. 
okay odd chain fatty acids on oxidation give rise to propionyl coa and this propionyl coa gets converted to methyl malonyl coa very good um Kwarme, I'm very happy that you have answered it as methionine, but it is not cysteine. So not only odd chain fatty acids, even Vim amino acids. Have you all heard of Vim amino acids? Valin, isoleucine and methionine also give rise to propionyl coa. So odd chain fatty acids on oxidation give rise to propionyl coa and that propionyl coa will give rise to methyl malonyl coa. Okay. Now tell me what is expected whenever there is B12 deficiency. Whenever there is B12 deficiency, methyl malonyl CoA mutase will be inactive. So what will accumulate in the blood? Methyl malonyl CoA will accumulate in the blood that gets reflected in the urine. So in urine, what will you expect? Methyl malonic aciduria. Do you understand this? So whenever you suspect B12 deficiency, what is expected? Methyl malonyl CoA mutase will be inactive. So what accumulates in the blood? Methyl malonyl CoA accumulates in the blood that gets reflected in urine. So what you would observe is methyl malonic aciduria. So if you suspect B12 defi deficiency, what will you estimate in urine? You will estimate methyl malonic acid levels in urine after an overnight fast. So can you tell me why do you do it after an overnight fast? Until you feed a patient, yeah, until you feed a person, there is no peripheral lipolysis at all. So only when a person starves himself or herself, there is peripheral lipolysis. That is when fatty acids will get channelized to liver. When fatty acids get channelized to liver, odd chain fatty acids will also reach the liver. And in liver, odd chain fatty acids will undergo oxidation. Very good, Pratishta. Very good, Shangapriyan. Excellent. So, only when you starve the person, there is peripheral lipolysis. Odd chain fatty acids reach liver. In liver, fatty acids get oxidized and they give rise to propionyl CoA. Propionyl CoA happily becomes methyl malonyl CoA. But because this person has got B12 deficiency, it is not converted to succinyl CoA. So methyl malonyl CoA accumulates. Do you understand this? So whenever you suspect B12 deficiency, estimate methyl malonic acid level in urine. Okay. So now I am going to fill up this tabular column with your help. Yeah. Can you all give me answers to this? So whenever you suspect B6 deficiency, what will you estimate in urine? 6 has got X. So what will you estimate in urine? You are going to estimate xanthurinic acid level in urine. After what load? After X, what is the alphabet? Y. So what is the load that you are going to do? Tryptophan load test. Are you clear? So whenever you suspect B6 deficiency, you estimate xanthurinic acid level in urine after tryptophan load. Very good. Good uh, D. Raman, Sharma, good Mahak. Yes. Now what will you do if you suspect folate deficiency? F for F. If you suspect folate deficiency, what is that you estimate in urine? You will have to estimate figlu levels in urine. After what load? After F and G, it is H. So after it is histidine load. Clear? So histidine load test is done to detect folate deficiency. Now, if you suspect B12 deficiency, what will you estimate in urine? Just remember methyl malonic aciduria. So, B12 deficiency is identified by estimating methyl malonic acid level in urine after an overnight fast. Okay, after an overnight fast. Is that clear to all of you? I hope it's clear. So, B1 deficiency. I'm going to summarize all that I've told you so far. After this summarizing, yeah, after this, uh, after we summarize everything, I will then tell you about Schilling's test because twice Schilling's test has been asked. Okay, so what have I told you so far? We started with B1. Yeah, B1 deficiency, one meal a day keto diet. So keto stands for RBC transketolase activity. It stands for RBC transketolase activity. And then B2 or riboflavin, ribbon and glue. Yeah, ribbon and glue go hand in hand. So if you suspect B2 deficiency, what will you estimate? You will estimate RBC's glutathione reductase activity. 
if you suspect b3 deficiency what will you estimate in urine b3 is niacin so what will you estimate it is rbc nad concentration or urinary methyl niacinamide concentration that's all about b1 b2 b3 now b6 we know clearly 6 xanthiurinic acid level is estimated after tryptophan load folate f or f figlu levels are estimated after histidine load b12 methyl malonic acid levels are estimated after an overnight fast yeah i hope it's clear so that's all about all these vitamin deficiencies now this is an interesting question because this question is being repeatedly asked and if you try to read this straight from harrison so all that i'm going to tell you about this question is straight from harrison if you try reading it from harrison you might find it difficult to understand yeah that's why i've tried uh, making it simple okay so the question is a person who's on mixed balance diet presented with tiredness weakness macrocytic anemia and subacute combined degeneration so if you see a combination of macrocytic anemia and subacute combined degeneration what will you suspect it is b12 deficiency if there is only macrocytic anemia okay no neurological manifestations only macrocytic anemia no neurological manifestations then you can suspect folate deficiency but if there is macrocytic anemia and subacute combined degeneration it is b12 deficiency he was given radio labeled b12 orally and then intramuscular unlabeled b12 was injected so radio label b12 means it is shilling's test okay uh, 24 hours urinary radio label b12 was less than 10 percentage of orally administered dose after oral intrinsic factor 24 hours urinary label b12 was more than 10 percentage of orally administered dose which of the following is the probable cause so forget about this complex concept yeah for now forget about this complex concept when they've given radio labeled unlabeled b12 and then they've estimated 24 hours urinary uh, b12 forget about that for some time okay so can it be dietary b12 deficiency just tell me that yes or no can it be dietary b12 deficiency good uh, shanmuga priyan shanmuga priyan is rocking nisha good i'm happy that you have tried it so tell me dietary b12 deficiency can that be a cause here it can't be a cause yeah because for, because of two reasons the first reason is they've given you the person is on mixed balanced diet when is dietary b12 deficiency expected it is mostly expected only in a vegan okay because b12 sources are non-vegetarian sources so b12 dietary deficiency is more common in veganism that is one reason the other reason is what is provided is after giving orally radio label b12 only less than 10 percentage of orally administered doses found in urine which means water we have given orally has not been absorbed which means it is malabsorption do you understand this it's not dietary deficiency what is it it is malabsorption so we have excluded dietary b12 deficiency so let me tell you all about Schilling's test but for you to understand about Schilling's test I want you to know the requirements for B12 absorption okay so what are the requirements of B12 absorption for that you will have to know uh, three facts related to how B12 is uh, sourced by your body yeah the three facts are number one is source of B12 can you tell me what is the major source of B12 just now I told you non-vegetarian source so this is one fact which you should all remember the second fact is for b12 to be absorbed it should go and bind to cobalophilin receptors in the terminal ileum second fact that you should remember is b12 gets absorbed only after it goes and binds to cobalophilin receptors in the terminal ileum and the third fact that you should remember is it gets absorbed only in the terminal ileum unlike most other nutrients yeah like most other nutrients which get absorbed in the upper small intestine b12 gets absorbed in the terminal ileum so have you understood these three facts yeah have you memorized these three facts it is predominantly non-vegetarian source it gets absorbed only after it binds to cobalophilin receptors in terminal ileum it gets absorbed only in the terminal ileum why should you know these three facts 
only when you know these three facts you will understand that your b12 when it is ingested is always attached to a protein it is conjugated to a protein so if you want b12 to be absorbed that protein has to be removed to remove the protein that is conjugated with b12 you need proteolytic enzymes which are released by pancreas yeah so what is the first requirement for b12 absorption it is pancreatic enzymes are you clear about this so why do we need pancreatic enzymes for vitamin b12 absorption it is because b12 sources are all non vegetarian so they are always conjugated with the protein so if b12 has to be absorbed that protein has to be removed so you need a proteolytic enzyme which is released by pancreatic juice and for cobalophilin receptors to go and bind to b12 b12 should be attached to intrinsic factor cobalophilin is nothing but extrinsic factor for extrinsic factor to go and bind to b12 b12 should be attached to intrinsic factor so tell me what is the second factor that is necessary for b12 absorption it is intrinsic factor that is released by your stomach yeah you know it is released by your parietal cells so that is a second factor that is necessary and the third factor that can determine b12 absorption is microorganisms yeah the third factor is microorganisms if there is blind loop syndrome what do you mean by blind loop syndrome if there is overgrowth of intestinal microorganisms in the colon what will they do they go and start utilizing b12 in the terminal ileum so in the terminal ileum if your microorganisms start utilizing those b12 they cannot get absorbed so blind loop syndrome is one of the causes of vitamin b12 malabsorption do you understand this so microorganisms and apart from this the last factor that determines b12 absorption is health of terminal ileum so whenever there is any damage that has happened to the terminal ileum for example crohn's disease what is crohn's disease or regional ileitis terminal ileum will be damaged and that can cause vitamin b12 malabsorption or celiac sprue yeah even in celiac sprue your terminal ileum will be damaged so b12 malabsorption can happen do you understand this so can you tell me what are the factors which determine vitamin b12 absorption the first factor is pancreatic enzyme presence the second factor is intrinsic factor that is released by parietal cells and the third factor is intestinal microorganisms which start utilizing vitamin b12 in the terminal ileum and the last factor is health of terminal ileum having understood these four facts i want all of you to type in the chat box causes of vitamin b12 malabsorption yeah can i wait for you to type what are the causes of vitamin b12 malabsorption the first cause of b12 malabsorption would be number 1 yeah pancreatic insufficiency yes or no one will be pancreatic insufficiency second one is intrinsic factor deficiency yeah intrinsic factor deficiency as which happens in autoimmune gastritis okay wherein parietal cells get damaged so intrinsic factor deficiency third one is overgrowth of microorganisms which we call as blind loop syndrome yeah and the fourth one is damage to terminal ileum what are the causes of damage to terminal ileum it is crohn's disease or what is other one i told you celiac sprue okay crohn's disease or celiac sprue so let me repeat this what are the causes of vitamin b12 malabsorption pancreatic insufficiency intrinsic factor deficiency blind loop syndrome yes blind loop syndrome and crohn's disease okay now what is schilling's test i want you to know i am very sure that all of you know that schilling's test is related to b12 but what you people fail to understand yeah it is not your fault it is a, it is the way uh, you have approached biochemistry so far okay it's not your fault at all so what you think is you always relate schilling's to b12 and you think schilling's test is done to detect b12 deficiency we don't perform schilling's test to find out if there is b12 deficiency because what is the test that you perform to find out if there is b12 deficiency that is methyl malonic acid level is estimated in urine after an overnight fast so what is the purpose of schilling's test it is found to find out if there is vitamin b12 malabsorption 
do you understand this so what is the purpose of schilling's test it is to find out if there is vitamin b12 malabsorption and if there is vitamin b12 malabsorption what is the cause of vitamin b12 malabsorption so these are the two questions that will be answered when you perform schilling's test okay now what are the steps that you have to follow before you perform schilling's test step number 1 is you have to treat b12 and folate deficiency do you understand this what is step number 1 you have to treat b12 and folate deficiency if you are asking me why it is because b12 and folate deficiency by itself will cause gastritis by itself will cause immune uh, inflammation of the intestinal epithelium so whenever intestinal epithelium gets damaged that by itself will cause b12 malabsorption do you understand this yeah because b12 and folate both are necessary for rapidly dividing la bile cells and your enterocytes are rapidly dividing la bile cells when they get affected b12 and folate deficiency by itself can cause b12 malabsorption so step number 1 is you have to treat b12 and folate deficiency okay and then what is step number 2 step number 2 is you give orally radio labeled vitamin b12 yeah step number 2 is you give orally radio labeled vitamin b12 when you give orally radio labeled vitamin b12 it gets absorbed along the intestine and then it first goes to the liver yes yeah, so or no after it gets absorbed it first goes to the liver when it goes to the liver first it goes and binds to b12 receptors of the liver only when those b12 receptors of the liver get saturated the excess will overflow into circulation and that will be found in urine and because to find out if there is b12 malabsorption you are going to estimate urinary vitamin b12 you should first saturate liver vitamin b12 receptors so how do you saturate vitamin b12 receptors by giving unlabeled uh, b12 so what will you give you give intramuscularly please understand this you give intramuscularly unlabeled vitamin b12 what is the purpose of that the purpose of that is to saturate liver receptors of b12 so that anything which is orally intaken anything which is absorbed along the intestine will directly get into urine do you understand this so i'm going to repeat till step 3 what is step number 1 please understand step number 1 is treat b12 and folate deficiency step number 2 you give orally radio labeled vitamin b12 when you give that the highest probability is that this orally given radio labeled b12 goes and binds to b12 receptors of the liver we don't want that to happen so you have to saturate b12 receptors of the liver for which you give intramuscularly unlabeled vitamin b12 so that anything which is absorbed along the intestine will get into urine so after you do all this you collect 24 hours urine after this what do you do you collect 24 hours urine and in 24 hours urine you measure radio labeled vitamin b12 concentration do you understand this in 24 hour urine you measure radio label vitamin b12 concentration if you see less than 10 percentage of orally administered radio label vitamin b12 to be found in urine only less than 10 percentage is found in urine it means it is not absorbed do you understand this it means it is not absorbed which means there is mal absorption so when will you say there is vitamin b12 malabsorption when less than 10 percentage of orally administered vitamin b12 was found in urine that is diagnostic of presence of malabsorption okay now with this can you stop can you say that you have vitamin b12 malabsorption to a patient and can you stop with that no right what should you do you should find out what is the cause of vitamin b12 malabsorption so to find out the cause of vitamin b12 malabsorption you repeat the test after you give orally intrinsic factor what do you do the next step is you give orally intrinsic factor after you give orally intrinsic factor you give orally radio label vitamin b12 and then check how much of that is excreted in urine so now if it's more than 10 percentage after oral administration of intrinsic factor if more than 10 percentage of orally administered vitamin b12 is found in urine it means the b12 malabsorption has been treated by intrinsic factor administration 
which means so long it was because of intrinsic factor deficiency so what will be the cause of intrinsic factor deficiency it is autoimmune gastritis do you understand this after oral administration of intrinsic factor if more than 10 percentage of orally administered vitamin b12 is found in urine then it is autoimmune gastritis now even after oral administration of intrinsic factor if less than 10 percentage is still found in urine then what has been excluded you have excluded autoimmune gastritis do you understand this? Excluded autoimmune gastritis as a cause of vitamin B12 malabsorption. So you go to step number 6. What will you do in step number 6? You give 3 days of oral antibiotics. What will happen when you give 3 weeks of oral antibiotic? This oral antibiotic will clear of blind loop syndrome. So after oral antibiotic, if more than 10% of orally administered vitamin B12 was found in urine, then so long it was because of blind loop syndrome. Do you understand this? It means so long it was because of blind loop syndrome, which has been corrected by you giving what? By you giving 3 week antibiotic. Even after 3 week antibiotic, if less than 10% of orally administered vitamin B12 is found in urine, then what has been excluded? Blind loop syndrome has been excluded. Okay. Now step number 7. This is the last step. So what will you do in step number 7? Here you are going to give what is left out. Pancreatic enzymes. Yeah. Step number 7 is you are going to give orally pancreatic enzymes for 2 days. So after this, if it is more than 10% of orally administered drug which is found in urine, then what is the cause? It is pancreatic insufficiency. If it is still less than 10%, then what is the cause? If it is more than 10%, it is pancreatic insufficiency. If it is less than 10%, pancreatic insufficiency has been excluded. So what is the cause? It is most probably celiac sprue or Crohn's disease. It is most probably celiac sprue or Crohn's disease. So have you understood all about Schilling's test? Yeah, I hope you have understood this. So I'm going to write all about Schilling's test here. Yeah, can you repeat it along with me? Yeah, Schilling's test. Point number one about Schilling's test is it is not done to find out if there is vitamin B12 deficiency. It is done to detect if there is vitamin B12 malabsorption. And if there is vitamin B12 malabsorption, it also helps you to find out what is the cause of vitamin B12 malabsorption. Okay. So what is step number one? All of you tell me what is step number one? You treat B12 and folate deficiency. Step number two is you give orally radio labeled vitamin B12. Do you understand this? You give orally radio labeled vitamin B12. What is step number three? Step number three is to saturate liver stores. You give intramuscularly unlabeled vitamin B12, which will saturate all liver receptors so that any uh, anything which is absorbed along the intestine gets excreted in urine. After that, step number four is you collect 24 hours urine of the patient. And in 24 hours urine, you measure radio labeled vitamin B12 concentration. When you measure radio labeled vitamin B12 concentration, yeah, when you measure uh, urinary vitamin B12 concentration, if it is less than 10% of orally administered drug, then it is diagnostic of malabsorption. If you have diagnosed malabsorption, then you go to step number 5. What will you do in step number 5? To find out the cause, you give orally intrinsic factor. After administration of intrinsic factor, if it is more than 10%, then what is the cause? It is autoimmune gastritis. Even after intrinsic factor administration, if it is still less than 10%, then what have, what have you excluded? You have excluded autoimmune gastritis. So you progress to step number 6. In step number 6, you give 3 week antibiotics. So after 3 week antibiotic, you again measure how much of orally administered drug is found, how much of orally administered vitamin B12 is found in urine. If it is now more than 10%, then what is the cause? It is blind loop syndrome. Even now if it is less than 10%, then you should go to step number 7. 
what will you do in step number seven you give two days yeah you give two days pancreatic enzyme and then repeat the test now if it is more than 10 percentage then what is the cause it is pancreatic insufficiency even now if it is less than 10 percentage then what is your diagnosis even if it's less than 10 percentage it is terminal ileal disease what are the two terminal ileal conditions which can cause vitamin b12 malabsorption it can be Crohn's disease or celiac sprue. Got it? Yeah. So I uh, suggest, yeah, my recommendation or my suggestion is that today you go try to read Schilling's test from Harrison. Yeah. Everything will be crystal clear. Yeah. All that I've told you here is from Harrison. Okay. So now try to answer this question. What have you excluded? Excluded dietary B12 deficiency. And then it is clearly B12 malabsorption. When there is malabsorption, what have they done? Why am I saying it is B12 malabsorption? Because 24 hours urinary radio label B12 was less than 10 percentage of orally administered dose. So there is definitely B12 malabsorption. After oral intrinsic factor, 24 hours urinary B12 was more than 10 percentage. It has been corrected now intrinsic factor supplementation is correcting b12 malabsorption so what is the cause it is type a gastritis or autoimmune gastritis clear yeah so that's all about vitamin deficiencies and the diagnostic tests i hope it helped all of you okay so whenever you read about vitamins please don't read like a school student trying to understand about sources of vitamins um, or about anything related to its structure that is not how questions are asked how are questions asked questions are always applied these days these are all clinically integrated mcqs so always try to find out if i am a clinician what would i do how will i find out the deficiency of a particular vitamin in a person if i find out what are the clinical manifestations that i suspect why am i suspecting all these clinical manifestations what should I expect in the clinical course of my patient? Yeah, that is how you should approach vitamins. Okay. Thanks, Mahak. Okay, so thank you all. See you all again with one other session uh, on YouTube. There is another session on YouTube. I think it's related to PCR. Okay. Yeah, I will share the PDF in the Telegram group right away. Okay. So see you all. Good night.